So politics in language and language in politics. Technology, it's often said, is neither good nor bad, but nor is it neutral. Uh, technology does in, its, in itself determine political outcomes um, uh, in the world. Yet like, like anything that's made or built that is guided by design towards ends or purposes, it has particular intentions and purposes embedded within it. Technology enables certain things and don't enable other things. Yet just because technology is not neutral and instead is purposive and directional in particular ways, does that mean technology is political? Is technology political in the way that increasingly heated debates around digital technology and politics seem to suggest? I want to propose over the course of this talk that technology is political and it is political all the way down to programming languages. Now, because of that charged and polemical nature of contemporary debates, that risks, I think, being a bit confronting and already possibly a bit misleading. Firstly, much depends on what we mean by political. Political seems to imply something pejorative, something that debases, something that sullies purity. If technology is political, it's grubby, it's distorted, nasty even. Well, it should come as a little surprise that that's not how a political scientist thinks about the political. What we're interested in is the organization and practice of power in society and how this shapes societal outcomes and change. So I want to first clear the air straight away. To say that technology is political is not a value laden or pejorative claim. My interest is in understanding the role that societal power held by different actors in society to different degrees, plays in shaping the possibilities of technology, what they might be and what they might do, and how technology from those possibilities in turn shapes the possibilities of societal power. This two-way relationship is dynamic and complex, and one must take care with calibrating it, with analyzing it, because we mustn't either underplay nor overdetermine the role of technology in politics, nor the role of politics in technology. Secondly, to say that technology is political all the way down to programming languages, it's not to suggest that something uniquely troubling about programming languages, but rather to emphasize that language, any language, including what we might call natural language, is at the very heart of politics. To explain this over the course of this talk, I wanna historicize the role of language in politics and the deeply interwoven role of language in institutions of societal power. Bridging language across politics um, and, uh, and language and politics across history and bridging what connects natural languages with programming or formal languages, I wanna try and make the case for understanding language or language as a technology of politics, giving particular attention to the materiality of language in technical artifact. Indeed, by saying that technology is political all the way down to language, it's one way of just saying that language and technologies of language are at the very heart, the center, the foundations of societal power and politics. When languages change, including how they come into being and work, as well as who finances, designs, distributes, applies and uses them, this change strikes at the heart, the center and the foundation of politics. So where this talk reaches and where this leaves me as a political scientist examining our digital age is to seek to understand more precisely how something profoundly important is happening with computer programming languages that is changing language in politics and the politics of language. So how does a political scientist think about the role of language in politics? Let me start with answering this question in order to lay the groundwork for the claim that language is at the heart of politics and politics is at the heart of language. So I've introduced the idea that to control language to achieve a is to achieve a level of foundational power in politics. This is because language plays a crucial role in determining the possibilities and limits of political control and its contestation. 
To understand this, we first need to get a grip of what politics is fundamentally about. So there are many ways to answer the question, what is politics all about? Perhaps the most simple pithy way to capture it was given to, given to us by one of the 20th century's most towering political animals, Vladimir Lenin. Lenin summarized politics up in just two words, who and whom. Who has power over who? That's what it all came down to. For Lenin, this came down to class struggle, which class is on top of which, etc. But we don't need to understand politics as class struggle to appreciate Lenin's basic point. Politics is about power, about the power to exercise control over others and about the counter power to contest others' control. Politics is about the dynamic contestation of power. And from there, we see politics as contestations, not only between classes, but also between state and society between state security forces and rebels or insurgents, between incumbent parties of government and political opposition, between the army and the executive, or between the executive and the legislature, between powerful corporations and financial institutions and governments and public institutions, between experts and technocrats and populists, between powerful majority ethnic or social groups and minorities, between indigenes and new arrivals, between citizens and strangers. In essence, between diverse configurations of us and them deploying and contesting power. And this power, the power to control and the power to contest itself takes different forms. In another neat classic expression of this, we have the image of power presented to us by Nicolai Machiavelli, the Italian Renaissance diplomat and intellectual. For Machiavelli, power is personified in the centaur, the ancient, uh, mythical ancient Greek and Roman um, uh, beast that was half creature that was half man, half beast. Power too, Machiavelli said, was half man, half beast, a necessary combination of consent and coercion. Power involves consent, those who command followership or authority garner legitimacy in the eyes of those who fall under that authority. If they do, they have power to make decisions and influence others. But power also involves coercion. Those who possess implements of violence and tools for obtaining submission also possess a capacity, actual or threatened, and can influence through with this the behavior of others. So Machiavelli observed that coercion often mattered more than consent for a ruler to maintain rule, but there are misinterpretations of what he argued and why, and that's a matter uh, not for today. The modern nation state possesses tremendous power precisely because of how it combines high levels of coercion and consent. The monopoly over the legitimate use of violence rests with the state in tremendously lethal forms. Equally, the state through government claims to protect and progress the nation on behalf of the citizenry, to act on the citizenry's behalf with its consent. Yet it is the entanglement, the mixing of forms of coercion and consent in state power that is perhaps the most important of all. States administer, police, tax, regulate, rule over the lives of citizens through complex bureaucratic forms of power precisely because of how coercion mixes with consent in the background. And this is where language starts to come in. Centralized authorities like states, but also I should note in passing corporations and firms, depend heavily on bureaucratic power or what the sociologist Max Weber called rational legal authority, power sourced from laws, written rules and regulations and power that manifests in system, process, order, and ultimately in the efficient use of information and in the production of knowledge that enables governability. Weber was writing in the early 20th century about the rise to dominance of the modern state. He saw in bureaucracy, the perfection of ordered, structured, hierarchical, specialized, and technical decision-making authority. The management of bureaucracy across time and space 
was based in turn upon written documents, the files, and the writers of them, officials, the scribes. Moreover, for Weber, modern means of communication enter the picture as pacemakers of bureaucratization. They were of decisive importance. Control over telegraph networks, he observed, was crucial to the modern states from Persia to the, net, to the West. Weber also observed that every bureaucracy seeks to increase the superiority of the professionally informed by keeping their knowledge and intentions secret. The treasury officials of the Persian Shah, he wrote, have made a secret doctrine of their budgetary art and even used secret script. So beyond efficiency and pace, the control of information flows and expert techniques of calculability in the production of knowledge can create comparative advantage for bureaucratic power over other forms of power. This story of a central dimension of political power involving the control of information and its capture, transmission, processing, and storage in the production of knowledge is nearly as old as politics itself. The heart of political power over territory, population, and productive resources is the capacity to efficiently produce knowledge on that territory, population, and resources in order to centralize the capacity to administer it across space and time. And at the heart of the control over telegraph networks, over the files, over the scribes and the officials, over secret script, at the heart of all of this, of course, is language. Now, this is a much older story than the modern state, as Weber II recognized. Indeed, some have argued that the development and application of written script went hand in hand with the emergence of states in antiquity. The political anthropologist James Scott, uh, author of Seeing Like a State, which I was delighted to see was the subject of a workshop at this um, computer science conference yesterday, uh, Scott, in examining early state-making experiments in southern Mesopotamia, went so far as to say writing makes states, that writing was itself an artifact of statecraft. In various kingdoms of Sumer, it was through written script that thousands of cultivators, artisans, traders, and laborers were being counted, taxed, conscripted, put to work, and subordinated to a new form of control. And for this, cuneiform was a systematic technology of numerical record keeping and regularizing forms of notation that emerged alongside proto-states. Writing, Scott argues, was used for statist bookkeeping for half a millennium before it was reflected in literature, chronicles, or religious texts. For Scott, then, the state is a recording, registering, and measuring machine, and early states perfected written languages for record keeping. The legibility of people and things, labor and assets, underpins the power and wealth of centralized authorities, such that writing and language matter enormously. Appropriation required inventories, recording debts and dues, and accounting for, max, for and maximizing populations, and thus the population role in early forms of the census. The utopian ideal of statecraft is the all-seeing, all-knowing gaze from a central point to the reaches of territory and population. Central to state formation is standardization and abstraction. The written code and standardized nomenclature, nomenclature is central to this. It is what Scott calls a distance demolishing technology compared to the variabilities of oral and vernacular judgments. Indeed, the systematized and order obsessed but short-lived Qin dynasty in China made an intense effort to simplify complex iagrams that had um, existed across numerous um, uh, dynasty, dynastic states beforehand um, to simplify that tremendously in order to enhance the clarity and efficiency with which central rule could view its domain. Now, of course, legibility and accuracy are two very different things. Records and cadastral surveys are, quick, are soon quickly out of date. 
this disconnect between the record uh, that's written and actual social social political reality has two important implications. On the one hand, the state has to ensure continuous record keeping. Administrative structures need, are needed to sustain information flows, to regularize calculation and knowledge assembly, and to serve institutional, institutional memory. But on the other hand, accuracy matters less than the power to render legible and then to act on this knowledge that's produced from it. As the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu argues, the power to name is an act in the world that also acts upon the world. It creates a reality according to which others must relate, must subject themselves to, or must resist. So for Bourdieu though, then this distinction between the record and reality um, and the disconnects like for Scott introduces the importance of intermediary power. Documents can be forged and fiddled, scribes can serve themselves or sell favors. The control over script and language use becomes a new realm of the contestation over power. And writing in script also reduces new forms of resistance. In the peripheries of Southern Mesopotamia, as in other stories of the rise and falls of states and empires, resistance involved rejecting the use of writing, rejecting submission to legibility, seeking to retain invisibility. So this story of the relationship between political power, the production of knowledge, and the centrality of notational systems, script, and language is one that repeats itself throughout political history. Another prominent version of it is in the practices of European colonization. So contra Weber, many have argued that the rise of the European modern state, its practices and techniques of bureaucratic state power was less endogenous uh, than often assumed. The rise of the modern state went hand in hand with imperial conquest and domination in global peripheries. It was in these contexts that some of the very specific applications of notational systems, linguistic standardizations, modalities of classification and enumeration and communication technology, all in order to accumulate power, extract efficiently and enact control were resourced, designed, tested, and perfected. The compulsion to record, register, classify, and sort in pursuit of extraction and subjugation produced very particular formats of information technology. And these formats also embedded values and prejudices by those seeking or enacting domination and extraction. Equally, colonizers weren't all powerful. They had local dependencies. They depended on translators and scribes, and their tools of extraction and control were capable of appropriation and resistance. Writing on the British in India, Bernard Cohen in an essay entitled, The Command of Language and the Language of Command, finds in the National Archives of the East India Company, a form of tribute, tribute in the sense of a payment that is made by one ruler or nation to another, either as acknowledgement of submission or a price of protection. The tribute represented in the print and manuscripts that he was observing in these archives of the East India Company is that of complicated and complex forms of knowledge created by Indians, but codified, codified and transmitted by Europeans. The conquest of India was a conquest of knowledge. The knowledge held by indigenes and colonial subjects was given away under duress in order to be codified using language and notational systems in artifacts, files, papers, manuscripts that produced knowledge that underpinned colonial domination and control. So Cohen argues that the British invaded and conquered not only a territory, but an epistemological space. And this command of new information technologies made the British state too. The projects of state building in both countries, documentation, legitimation, classification, and bounding, and the institutions therewith, often reflected theories, experiences, and practices worked out originally in India and then applied in Great Britain, as well as vice versa. However, Cohen, like Scott, is at pains to emphasize the disconnect between the record and reality and the contested intermediary space of language. 
This is precisely, again, where language is political. To explore and conquer, the British relied heavily on translation. Establishing correspondence could make the unknown and the strange knowable. Knowledge of local languages was necessary to issue commands, collect taxes, maintain law and order, and to create other forms of knowledge about people they were ruling. In turn, a central pillar of British rule was to appropriate Indian languages to serve as a crucial component of the system of rule. The production of grammars, dictionaries, treatises on Indian languages began to establish a discursive formation and define an epistemological space that converted, converted Indian forms of knowledge into European objects. Classificatory and notational systems that underpin colonial power depended on local languages and translation. And though they could never be perfect or accurate, this dependency rendered language central to power and its contestation. Indeed, after a meticulous analysis of how this played out in British rule in India, Cohen concludes, Indians who increasingly became drawn into the process of transformation of their own traditions and modes of thought were, however, far from passive. In the long run, the authoritative control that the British tried to exercise over new social and material technologies was taken over by Indians and put to purposes which led to the ultimate erosion of British authority. The consciousness of Indians at all levels in society was transformed as they refused to become specimens in a European controlled museum of an archaic stage in world history. What do we take from this? The who whom question is never settled or certain. And the role of language is central to understanding this. The role of language in politics reveals how it enables dominant powers of coercion and maintaining consent, but also how it enables powers of contestation and resistance. The paper manuscripts in the East India Company colonial archives and the cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians also point to another matter of importance, namely the materiality of encoding language in technical artifact. This is an aspect of a, um, that a pioneering scholar of the political economy of media and communications, Harold Innes, emphasized. Materials constrain the possibilities of language and communication, and in turn shape the nature and limits of political power. Notational systems are coupled with media that they are encoded on. The stylus was invented because of the demands of clay in Sumerian civilization, and made possible the delegation of administrative and bureaucratic powers. In ancient Egypt, hieroglyphics set in stone ensured political salience over time, stone is lasting, but being expensive to make and heavy, relied on oral traditions to spread the word. Thus they were suited to absolute monarchy and limited spatial rule. By contrast, Papyrus allowed for the introduction of hieratic characters and enabled secularized power to grow in the hands of scribes. And this expanded the possibilities of empire. Another important example of the relationship between materiality and the encoding of language and how this is central to how language shapes politics is the Phoenician alphabet which for its simplicity and ease of encoding on papyrus, flourished as a portable language of trade. It enabled common, pe common people to write, but by so, by so doing also disrupted the status of royal and religious elites and scribes and upended class divisions. Access to the material for encoding language is also a source of power. The Roman conquest of Egypt gave them access to and control over papyrus and papyrus was essential for the bureaucratic development of the Roman Empire and its success in solving problems of administration over vast areas. Yet papyrus was also fragile and thus curtailed rule across vast space and time. This changed when the fragile papyrus role was offset by the Roman invention of the more durable parchment codex. The relationship between materiality, technical artifact, language, and political power can also be seen in the transformations brought about by paper and the printing press. While the centralized and monarchical Holy Roman Empire first forbade the use of paper for public documents because of its flimsiness, 
A few centuries later, paper manufacture had improved and flourished in parallel uh, with the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg. The significance of both are well known, though sometimes overstated. Innes argues that the printing press became a battering ram to bring abbeys and castles crashing to the ground. More precisely, the printing press dethroned Latin and a narrow literate class closely associated with the church by allowing for vernacular languages and literacy to flourish. And it created the world's first bestseller out of Martin Luther with the Gutenberg Bible. Moreover, the printing press, as the political historian Benedict Anderson famously argued, famously argued, made the imagined communities of nationalism possible through the circulation of shared texts. Print capitalism brought about by the standardization of, brought about the standardization of major European languages, mass reading publics, and enabled new forms, forms of societal power. It lies at the foundation, some argue, of the nation state. So this foundational power of language and politics, I think, reveals the politics in language. Across these epochs and these examples, I've underscored the intimate and interwoven connection between language and political power. The importance of language and politics incorporates both the materiality in which languages are encoded and the symbolic or representational uses to which languages are put. Dominant languages, particularly in the form of written script, arise from the vested political interests that lie behind them, and they enact those interests and in so doing further extend the power of those interests and the actors to whom they attach. They do this by encoding and rendering legible aspects of the social political world that, once reduced to transmissible information, can enable forms of knowledge production and action that underpin political power and serve political interests. Yet invariably, in seeking to encode and render legible a world that is elusive to static and reductive abstractions, and in depending on intermediaries to translate and to transcribe and make meaning, the role of language in politics is not fully determined and remains open to contestation. Language is foundational to politics, and because of this, there is a crucially important politics in how languages are produced, designed, distributed, intermediated, and applied and used. What language gives meaning to and does not, how it can be used to make meaning and not, and by whom and who not, depends heavily on political factors. The who whom question of politics plays out through the control and contestation of power through language. And so the who whom question applies to language itself. Who has power over the creation and use of language? Let me now disaggregate some key dimensions of the politics of language that start to emerge. First is the politics in production. Languages emerge within and are shaped by political intentions and purposes. The political economy of language production matters. Dominant languages are those that are able to be financed and resourced by powerful actors seeking to maintain or expand power. This politics is embedded within what can be said in a language and how, by what means, and what materials it is encoded in. For states and empires, old and modern, the need to record and render legible was linked to creating informational advantages for knowledge production that underpinned their broadcasting of power and extraction of rents. The political economy of language production, who finances language making and why, creates foundational biases towards encoding the meaning of particular things in particular ways. There is then the politics in design. The political economy logics create broad biases toward the encoding the meaning of particular things in particular ways. But the specificities matter. Crucial decisions are always made by those who control the design of languages as to how languages encode meaning and how they decide forms of abstraction. Choices made concerning how to encode meaning and design abstractions will determine forms of knowledge and their power. It is in the specificities of their design that languages will produce new legibilities and epistemological realities that, backed by political power, will shape actual socio-political socio realities. 
Languages that are purposively designed for record keeping will enable forms of power based in calculability. Equally, language designers possess political powers that they might not even foresee. The Phoenician alphabet's simplicity followed the practical needs of a trading civilization, but the effects of this simple alphabet in expanding literacy in any society that interacted with it was far reaching. The designers of a language encode its fundamental political potentialities inadvertently or advertently, including the language's relative openness or closeness to plural and democratic forms of meaning making. There is also a politics in distribution. The design of languages and how they are encoded materially also influences distributional logics. The Phoenician alphabet spread widely because it was efficiently encoded on papyrus. <clears throat> because of distributional power, control over materiality, literacy, and use of languages is contest contested. The printing press allowed for vernacular languages to dethrone Latin and underpin Protestant Reformation and even nationalism. But the distributional economies of print capitalism also ensured that some prominent vernacular dialects absorbed and erased local variations. Those who control the distributional propagation of languages through controlling property, material or intellectual, shape the language's exclusivity or inclusivity. There is also a politics in the intermediation and application. Whatever the context of their emergence, whatever the design and distribution, languages enable power in others who straddle literacy of the language and acts of abstracting the social world. Scribes, translators, intermediaries, software developers. Languages enable new nodes and modes of power to emerge, including power that can resist dominant power. The extent to which a language enables or constrains the agency of intermediaries matters to the language's autocratic or democratic tendencies. There is also a politics of language use. Users of languages and their applications can be many or few, mostly due to the intentionalities embedded into the language technologies, but not entirely limited by this. Despite its foundational power that is bound up in who shapes and controls languages at the outset, language and its possibilities for politics is always underdetermined. Language use is active and depends on how users receive and sometimes resist it. The wholesale rejection of language use is also a political act. So from here, I'd just like to make some concluding thoughts on programming languages and our digital age. So far, I've stayed on mostly safe grounds as a scholar of politics. And so it is with a healthy instinct of trepidation that I venture to offer this audience some reflections on the implications of, of what I've said so far on the politics of language for computer scientists working on programming languages. But here I go. The first thing that strikes me is that the political economy of programming language production and distribution is to some extent without precedent. Programming languages that dominate our digital age are privatized in ways that do not have historic precursors. Language production, design and distribution has historically been heavily controlled by dominant societal power. Print capitalism, democratized vernacular language use, albeit by privatizing its distributional markets in press and publishing. Programming languages, however, seem to build an, build an entirely new tribute system where previous language dominance through control of materiality and linguistic complexity is replaced with control of intellectual property and possibly the threat of language redundancy. Commercially owned dominant programming languages can, to a certain extent, be switched off like no languages passed. Distributional control also takes new forms. Who controls how the software that is written in a web browser works, for example? What are the implications for applications such as ad blockers, which undermine the commercial interests of those who possess distributional control of the language? Paradoxically, I think this situation also places even greater power in the hands of programming, programming language designers um, themselves. It's hard for me to know, not being a computer scientist um, or a designer of programming languages, exactly how this plays out. And I'm certainly interested to know and understand more. 
But one aspect that seems apparent to me from my observations elsewhere is how choices made about how the socio-political world is encoded into databases matter. The rendering of complex and fluid realities into canonically ordered discrete sonata that are then computable suggests to me how software applications built on the possibilities that programming languages allow produce forms of knowledge and political power in some ways and not others. It seems clear to me that programming language designers create the possibilities for different ways in which meaning can be encoded. They make choices in, choices in designing abstractions that make legibility and calculability possible in some ways and not possible in other ways. Language designers make crucial decisions that in increase or limit the agency and vulnerability of others who depend on programming languages to develop applications or to use those applications. Of course, the societal power that programming language designers possess is, is relative, it's bounded between the power of those who control production and distribution, as well as those who dominate subsequent software application and development. Still, when designers of programming languages step back and get ahead of the politics of language and understand the political context in which languages are designed, I think language des programming language designers are, are more likely to have a say that matters. If they don't, the politics will play out and influence their own agency and vulnerability in ways that, um, that ne will in inevitably happen. Here, one further and perhaps final point strike that strikes me about programming languages is the unique relationship between programming language designers and their digital intermediaries, software de developers. Um, this relationship is potentially far more dynamic and interrelated than in the past, as seen in the work within program language usability. Programming languages can iterate and develop rapidly, and thus programming language designers can enable developers in new, ever new and different ways, depending on how and how much they orient their work to the ap language application and use. For me, there's a, there's a new kind of micro tactical politics of making languages here because of this dynamic um, um, nature of, 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 of language development. And it's somewhat without precedent. It's quite exciting, even, um, even if more of a potential than a reality. It is perhaps the politics that lies behind or at the heart of your field or, and, and, and the, 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 the um, shared uh, purposes that you have at this conference. Um, and on that note, I'll, I'll leave my thoughts there and welcome the dis questions and discussion.